Now, we need to look at some of the factors that go into knowledge. What does it mean to know something? To know something is not the same as believing something. Although to know it, you have to believe it, I think. So I may believe X, but X is false. So if X is false, this is from last week, Truth and Knowledge. If, X, if you can't find it, just look at Cordovan chapter 3. Um, if I believe X and X is false, I can't have knowledge of X. Because the necessary condition for knowing X is that X is true. But it's not enough to believe X and X is true. Those are two out of the three necessary conditions, but they're not jointly sufficient. You need one more. You need a warrant or you need a reason or you need a justification for believing it. So let's say you very stupidly buy a lottery ticket and you believe you're going to win. Okay? For no reason. You just say, oh, I have a feeling. I have a feeling. It's my lucky day. And you, and you do win. I still don't think you knew because you had no sufficient reason. It was a lucky guess. All right? You may sometimes have multiple choice tests. Not here, because I think they're ridiculous with respect to the humanities. But if you have a multiple choice test, you may luckily guess the right answer. You can't say that you knew it. This is one deep epistemological reason I don't use them. Because you could guess your way into a proper answer. That's not knowledge. The point of education is knowledge, not guessing. So, knowledge is to use the classic shorthand, justified true belief. And how you justify something is a long and multifaceted story. We will deal with it tonight to some extent. How do you justify a proposition? It depends on the proposition. Remember, a proposition is a truth claim. So how do you know or determine that a truth claim is true? You have to use some pattern of warrant or justification. You have to give some reason for it. And of course, that's where apologetics comes in. This is my worldview. This is what I believe. And this is why I believe it. And this is why I think you ought to believe it. I, I believe that I know it. And I would like you to know it as well. But I'm not going to ask you to take a blind leap of faith. I'm going to give you some reasons to support the truth of the proposition. All right, you with me so far? All these terms, all these definitions are extremely important. Now, just informally, we use the word knowledge sometimes, not in this technical way. We might talk about the increase of knowledge through the information age. But we don't really mean that that seriously because there's an increase in information. But it doesn't mean there's an increase in knowledge because a lot of the information is false. And a lot of the information you receive, you really have no way of giving a reason whether or not to believe it. So it may not attain to the status of knowledge. So our goal in apologetics is to understand what knowledge is and how knowledge can be attained. All right? So we have to look at the components of knowledge. The first category is self-evidence. Now, what we're trying to do when we're talking about knowledge claims is a discipline called epistemology. And it has to do simply with how do you know what you know? What are the conditions for knowledge? How do you justify a knowledge claim? How would you refute a knowledge claim? So anytime someone says, but how do you know that? It's an epistemological claim. Anytime you justify a proposition by saying, I believe X because of P, Q, and R, you are giving an epistemological argument. Okay? Now, we need to have a well-worked-out epistemology as apologists. And I hope this will become clear today and as we proceed along in the class. Just to be a human being, a self-respecting human being, I think you need a good epistemology. Because people are making claims all the time about products, about politicians, about relationships, about vacations, about real estate, about religions, about philosophies, about everything. And you need some kind of a standard. You need sufficient criteria to evaluate truth claims. That's what epistemology is. 
So the first category is self-evidence. Self-evidence. That is, some things can be known without marshalling empirical evidence and without, in some cases, even going through a process of argument. Let me try it out on you. A triangle has three sides. How do you know that? It's true by definition. That's how we understand a triangle. It is a three-sided plane figure, okay? You don't have to do any empirical observations. You don't have to consult 15 different dictionaries. That's what a triangle is. How do you know that a bachelor is an unmarried male? The same way. Now, there are things that are called analytic truths. Things that are, if you will, true by definition. They cannot be false. Another term for this is necessary truths. And we can't get into all the vicissitudes of modal logic here about different types of necessity and broadly logical necessity and logical necessity simpliciter. I don't even understand some of that, believe me. I mean, it's very obtuse stuff. Um, very difficult, very, very hard to penetrate. But there are some things, if you just understand the concept, You understand it's true. Those are in the analytic category. And I believe that the laws, the basic laws of logic that we talked about, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle and bivalence, are analytical truths. You really can't justify them by anything else. If you just understand them, you see, you intuit, if you will, that they're true. And this is not an intuition like, I have an intuition there's something wrong with that character. I don't know quite what it is, but I just know not like that. I mean, you know because you understand the relationship of the concepts. It's not some kind of inner, subjective, hard to put your finger on feeling. By intuition, I mean you just see it and you know it. But you, the law of non-contradiction does not appear as a conclusion. Now, you can say, all right, let's deny it and see what happens to discourse. We've done that before. You cannot communicate anything intelligibly or have any argument whatsoever without presupposing the law of non-contradiction. So you might say that there is a kind of transcendental argument for it. By transcendental, I simply mean unless you presuppose this, you can't know anything. You can't communicate anything. So that also relates to a reductio ad absurdum. Unless you accept the law of non-contradiction, you can't know anything, you can't communicate anything. But that's absurd. Because we can know some things and we can communicate some things. So there are truths that we know by, you could say, self-evidence that are analytical truths. Another one would be something cannot be green all over and red all over. Now, that's about an empirical object. But you don't have to do any studies to know that an object cannot be completely one color and completely another color. It's an analytical truth. Now, there are other types of beliefs, and these beliefs, by the way, are in the foundations of your belief system. Now, postmodernists love to critique foundationalism. And people like Stan Grenz and others will say, we're beyond foundationalism. They even have a book called that. And I want to ask them, how in the world can you rationally communicate with any other human being without having the laws of logic in the foundations of your worldview? They're not derived from anything else. But if you deny them, your entire noetic structure, your entire structure of knowing collapses because you cannot appeal to any common ground with anyone else according to these basic principles of logic. So these are definitely in the foundation. You build on them. They are part of the foundation. And then you build the superstructure upon them. So if you see two worldviews that make contradictory claims like Islam and Christianity about Christ, you know from your foundation they cannot both be true because they're contraries. They're contraries. Now, they could both be false, logically now, logical possibility. If Jesus never existed, then they're both false. Or if Jesus was neither a prophet nor God incarnate, let's say it was just some deluded character who got a really big following and pulled, up, pulled off the, the best trick in human history, both views would be false, but they can't both be true. So our, understandings of, our understanding of antithesis, which is my shorthand phrase for those basic laws of logic, is in the foundation of knowing. 
And this is not merely a Western or male or white issue. It is how people argue when they want to argue at all. They assume these basic principles, these basic laws in their argumentation as part of the foundation. Now, a big question is, can other things be in the foundation? Other items that you don't derive from other claims but are just there, these are called basic beliefs. It might be a basic belief of yours that there is an external world of other people that exist apart from your consciousness. It may not be. I mean, you might be able to give a good argument. You might say, no, there are times when I'm dreaming and that's not the external world. There are times when I'm awake and that is the external world. And I have criteria to distinguish the two. Maybe you have an argument. Skeptics love to bring this one up. How do you know you're not dreaming? Maybe you have criteria, maybe you don't. But it might be the case that your belief in external objects, a mind-independent reality, is a basic belief. And it could be that that basic belief doesn't need to be justified because there's no reason really to doubt it. And how would you ever refute it anyway? Now, a really big issue in religious epistemology is the question of whether belief in God and, in fact, the entire worldview can be basic and can be properly basic. Now, some things can be basic, but we know there's something wrong with them. Like I said, belief in the Great Pumpkin. That could be basic. No evidence for it, but it's believed. Well, we we think something's wrong with that belief. At least we should. Now, the question is whether the entire Christian worldview can be held as properly basic. Now, this represents a strand of religious epistemology, epistemology which has been engineered and prosecuted by some of the best Christian minds of the 20th century. Alvin Plantinga, Nicholas Wolterstorff are two of the key people. These are brilliant people. If you want to understand Plantinga's take on it, he has a book called Warranted Christian Belief. It's 500 pages long. Feel free to read it in your spare time. I don't approach it that way for a variety of reasons. The the reasons are actually quite involved and complex. I won't give all of them to you. But the base, one of the basic reasons is this. I think that the overall classical method of apologetics works. That is, I think there are good and sufficient reasons to believe in a creator who designed the universe who is the source of the moral law without appealing to the Bible as the Bible being the foundation. I believe you can take the Bible as a hypothesis and it can be, if you will, strongly verified by the facts. And moreover, you can take the hypothesis about the life and identity of Jesus as a hypothesis, what we find in the Bible. And I believe it can be verified strongly by good arguments and by appealing to the facts. Plantinga doesn't think you can do that. He thinks the classical arguments for God's existence are not that powerful. And the classic evidential arguments for the reliability of the Bible and the deity of Christ really don't win decisively philosophically. So he's thrown back to the idea of of belief in God is properly basic. And he gives all kinds of other examples of things you believe is properly basic. That is, they're justified. But they're not justified on the basis of something else. Like what you had for breakfast this morning. Basic memory claims are oftentimes believed without citing external evidence as to why you believe they are true. Now, this is brought up briefly in Cordouan. And Plantinga's move... Was, was very ingenious in the sense that could it be that your beliefs are justified internally for you without an appeal to evidence? On that, I want to say maybe so. You see, but it's one thing for my belief to be justified to me because of the internal witness of the Holy Spirit and then taking that claim and justifying it for someone else. If I say, well, I have a right to believe X because I believe God has worked in my heart through the Holy Spirit. I don't have any arguments for it, but I believe I'm within my epistemic rights to believe it because the concept of God is not internally contradictory. I'm not flaunting any epistemic obligations or violating any epistemic duties. That's one thing. Maybe that works. But to then talk to a skeptic or an unbeliever and say, well, well, I, I know in my noetic equipment God has structured it so and has awakened it through the Holy Spirit. I know that there's a God and it's the God of the Bible. 
and you can't tell me I'm irrational for believing it. I don't think that goes very far apologetically. Now, now to criticize Alvin Plantinga for just a, a pygmy like me is rather audacious because the guy has been one of the leading Christian philosophers of the last 40 years and still is. And his views are extremely sophisticated. And I don't want to poo-poo them in the slightest bit. But at the end of his book, Warranted Christian Belief, this 500-page tome, and he's been working on these issues for 30 years or more, he says the really important question is, is Christianity true? And he says, I think it is, but it goes beyond the powers of philosophy to say. I'm profoundly disappointed and disgusted with that remark, frankly. It goes beyond the power of philosophy to say whether or not it's true. You can say it's justified, it's rational for Christians to believe it. But you see, you can be justified to believe certain false assumptions, right? We talked about uh, geocentrism and heliocentrism. You could have been justified to believe geocentrism before the evidence came out for heliocentrism, right? I think there's such a thing as justified false belief. It sometimes happens. You wish it wouldn't, but in a fallen world, I think it does. My wife and I have great arguments about epistemology. You know, I'll be wrong about something, and she'll point it out. I'll say, but it was a justified false belief. Anyway, that's not going to be my approach to the class. As we'll see with Corden, my, my approach is more the classical method, or you might call it the, uh, the hypothesis verification method. It's not reformed epistemology. It's a particular version of the verificationist approach, which we'll get into in a moment. Now, we could study all that for hours and hours, but I've got to give you the shorthand version. Now, what about religious experience? We'll come back to religious experience. Because people will say, look, I know God has made an impact on my life and I know that this is true. I think that has some argumentative force if used carefully. Now, if you simply say, I know that I know in my knower and that's it, and I don't have to say anything else, Mormons can say that, Hindus can say that, and so on. It doesn't go very far at all. There are ways of presenting the argument that have some evidential clout, but we'll come back to that later. Okay? Now, another thing that has to do with self-evidence is immediate sensory awareness. Now, you can be a skeptic, but most of us will claim that if I see something and there's no reason to think I'm deluded or hallucinating, then I have grounds for believing that it exists. So if I see this briefcase, all things being equal, and I can touch it and so on, there is a briefcase. That's immediate sensory experience. Now, I have no immediate sensory experience of Australia. In fact, I've never been there. But I've met people from there and New Zealand. I've never been there. I have no direct sensory experience of it. Nor do I have direct sensory experience of uh, far-flung stars that you can only see through very powerful telescopes. So you can talk about direct sensory experience or augmented sensory experience, tele tele uh, you know, telescopes and microscopes and things like that. Just heard on NPR that they can now actually see an individual atom with a superpower microscope. And they talked about flaws in some of the atoms. I thought, what an interesting idea. An atom has a flaw. What does that say about the world? Anyway. So, how does this contribute to knowledge? Well, self-evidence, whether it's necessary truths or basic beliefs that are not necessary truths, I think make up, and direct sensory experience, are a necessary but not sufficient test for truth of a worldview. You need more than self-evidence and religious experience claims to have a well-justified, or you might say verified, or warranted worldview. It's a very important piece, but it's not the whole pie. Basically, with these elements, if you take one of the element, elements and exalt it to be everything, you lose something of, of epistemological significance. Okay, the next category is rationality and epistemology. And uh, when goes through ra uh, logical deduction. We've talked about that before. And he talks about rationalism as an epistemology. Now, rationalism is sort of the, the opposite of emphasizing uh, just empirical experience. In fact, you would say like Plato, 
would say you really can't trust empirical experience very much. It's so deceptive. It's so misleading so often. What you have to trust is what you can know through your reasoning abilities. And he had this whole epistemology being able to intuit the forms which are beyond the material spatial world and so on. And we don't have to go into all the platonic epistemology, but rationalism is a perspective on epistemology that emphasizes strong certainty, necessary truths, and what you can know without empirical claims. Okay. Now, Corduan has a small section there in the ontological argument. And he gives some criticisms of the ontological argument. The ontological argument is a classic argument which is a priori. It means it's apart from experience. All the ontological argument for God needs is the concept of God as the greatest possible being or a being that possesses all perfections. Anselm discovered this argument. And it has been the labor of many metaphysicians ever since to try to figure out if he was right or not. It is an argument that is extremely complex, that has multiple forms, and which typically will not have much purchase on the typical unbeliever because it is so highly sophisticated. And for that reason, I don't spend much time on it except to make some basic comments. I spend lots of time on cosmological design and moral arguments because I think they grip people more directly. Now, if you're dealing with somebody who's really studying philosophy and metaphysics, then the ontological argument could be a powerful tool because, frankly, I think there are versions of the ontological argument that work. They're controversial. But the genius of this argument is all you need is the idea of God is the greatest possible being. And the greatest possible being must exist. Now, there are ways of formulating this with modal logic as planning is done. And people have discerned two different versions in Anselm of the argument. It's been used by Descartes. It was used by Leibniz. It's been used by various people. The genius of this argument, if it works, is all you need is the concept of God. You don't even have to believe the concept of God is, is true. I mean, that it's your general concept of God. You just have to understand it. And the idea is, if there is this concept of God, then God must exist. That God exists in all possible worlds. Now, again, it's so complicated and it has so many forms that all I'm going to say is I think that there are versions of this argument that are very credible and would work for someone who's highly sophisticated in metaphysics. But I don't think it typically has much pertinence for people outside of that. Now, the comments that Corduan makes are rather negative on the argument, and I disagree with them. I don't think that his criticism is sufficient to sink the argument. I think the issue here is really pertinency, not really logical power. Are you with me on that? There are arguments that may be objectively very good arguments, but they're so complex, most people won't track with them. And we're not just about being good philosophers who can impress people with our philosophical ability. We want to convince people. We want to persuade people. Now, for that reason, I don't spend very much time on it in this class. We take a philosophy of religion class from me or Professor Obitz. You will spend time on it because I think it can be a very powerful argument. And the genius of the argument is it doesn't appeal to any contingent empirical factors. It merely appears to the, appeals to the very concept of God. So it's a classic case of rationalism. Now, using deduction, deduction is a necessary but not sufficient test of a worldview. There are things we know through deductive arguments. It is a good and important tool for some of our knowledge. But it is not the only tool of argument to use to ground knowledge. We also have induction. We have abduction. We have various types of intuition that can be rationally appealed to. And that's what you need to know is that deduction from necessary truths is very important in argumentation, or even deduction from only probable propositions is important. So you can have an argument, let's say, with four premises, and none of them are logically necessary truths. They're all contingent truths. They might be false. But if, it's more, if they're more likely true than false, and the argument form is deductive, then the conclusion is deductively derived. But it would be less than absolutely certain because it's possible that one of those premises is false. 
But the four may be deductive. Namely, if we have these four, and it's true, the conclusion follows by logical necessity. It's not probability. It's necessity. But the independent premises may only be probably true. Okay? So deduction is extremely important. You also have sensory information with respect to epistemology. And actually, I think when Wynne was talking about self-evidence or immediate sensory awareness before, he wasn't really talking about empirical observation. He was more talking about just your inner states, your inner feelings. So I jumped the gun on that one. He was really talking more about my inner sense, you know, that I feel hot or I feel cool or I feel the presence of God. Or maybe you have an intuition that there's something wrong with that character or something like that. Now, this part... This category is more in terms of empiricism. What can be verified empirically about the external world? Not just how the external world hits me or the impressions it makes on me, but what it is in itself. How knowable is that? And of course, the development of science is very concerned with finding empirical evidence to somehow support or verify hypotheses. Science may have certain core commitments that they cannot empirically verify. That are just presuppositions. We'll come back to that later with Moreland. But a big part of trying to verify something or falsify something scientifically, and I'm being oversimple here, is some kind of an appeal to evidence. I mean, when you're dealing with the, the issue of, of Darwinism, you deal with the evidence. At least you should. In fact, the way it's set up, oftentimes you can't. You can't question the evidence because if you question the evidence, you're not scientific at all. But if you're fairly dealing with the evidence for and against Darwinism, dissent with modification without purpose, then you look at things like the fossil record. You look at the arguments uh, that have been given. You look at the argument about homology indicating common ancestry. You take it apart. You look at the evidence for it. Okay. Now, you can never simply appeal to evidence without logic. Because if you're trying to build any kind of a conclusion, the conclusion either follows or doesn't follow from the premises. Now, you might say, uh, oh, there, look, there's a shooting star and someone sees the shooting star. Okay, there's an empirical claim that can be verified just by attending to it, assuming it wasn't fireworks or a UFO or something like that. But empiricism or the empirical dimension is extremely important for science, social science and apologetics. You see this as we'll get into it in the next few weeks with the cosmological argument, the design argument. When you deal with arguments against Darwinism, you deal with evidential factors, empirical factors. All right. Now, empiricists can be open or closed. A closed empiricist will say all we can know is what we somehow know through our senses or what can be derived through that. But it never attains to a metaphysical realm. It never attains, I should say, to a supernatural realm. Our knowledge is really limited by the empirical realm. And reality is, in a sense, limited to the empirical realm. So it's a one-layer worldview. It's a naturalistic worldview. Now, some people have an empirical orientation, pretty non-rationalist, but believe that empirical evidence may, in fact, may support metaphysical claims. And in fact, we'll argue that way when we deal with design and cosmological arguments that if the Big Bang occurred about 13 or 14 million years ago, that is strong evidence that it was brought into existence by a supernatural being. Now, that's based on the evidence derived from cosmology and astrophysics. It's evidence. Now, I would claim it comports with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, some people say it doesn't. Young Earth people say it doesn't because there's no way the Earth is 13 to 14 billion years old or the universe is that old. Some naturalists like Quentin Smith will say, no, the universe did pop into existence out of nothing, but it did so without a cause. So there's still no God. And some people want to deny that the universe popped into existence out of nothing because they want to grant antecedent states, existent states that explain it. But my point there is that you're appealing to empirical evidence. And with design arguments, such as uh, Behe's irreducible complexity argument, the mousetrap argument, which we'll get to later, he's appealing to evidence 
and a way of explaining the evidence. He's giving kind of a best explanation argument for it. That gradual mechanisms cannot explain something as fantastically complex and specified as the bacterial flagellum or the blood clotting cascade or something like that. So he's an empiricist, he's a biochemist, and he takes empirical data seriously, but in his explanations, Michael Behe now, he is open to there being signs of intelligence, that intelligent causes could best explain the bacterial flagellum, not naturalism, which is a matter-first worldview. Matter exists, matter and energy, natural laws, they just exist for no design purpose, and then life and sentience and personality comes out of that without any foreordination or any planning. See, so mind comes out of the non-mind. A sense of purpose and direction comes out of no purpose and direction and so on. So someone can take the empirical dimension very seriously, as I do, as an apologist or a scientist do, like Vihi, but not view it as a closed system. Say, no, there's empirical evidence for something beyond the empirical world. But sensory information is a necessary, not sufficient test for truth because you still have to have logical principles and they're not empirically verifiable. In fact, for the procedures of science, in terms of large-scale hypothesis verification or challenging hypotheses, there are certain values you need in these projects. Share your data fairly. Don't cherry-pick with statistics. Don't fudge your data. Now, you can't derive any of those propositions from empirical observations. They're value statements. Now, they're either true or false. They either correspond to reality or they don't. But they're not empirically derivable. There are a lot of things we know that are not empirically derivable. It's very important to realize this because a lot of people will come back to this. I always say that with great hope that we'll actually ever get to it. But the idea, oh, you can't believe in God. God is supposed to be invisible, right? Right? And if you can't see God, then God obviously could not exist. That is a very crass and stupefied empiricism. So you've got to challenge it at the root. Now, there are a lot of things you know that are not empirically verifiable, such as your deepest moral commitments. They're not empirically verifiable. There are other things like the laws of logic. They're not empirically verifiable. But to understand anything, including empirical data, you must presuppose them. But the laws of logic are not written on any atoms or written on the clouds, or written on tree bark somewhere. All right, you with me so far, these first three categories? Yes. Well, it shows that empirical data is limited in what it can communicate to us. It just shows a limit of knowledge. Now, some people have tried to take the indeterminacy principle and so on and say that reality itself is indeterminate and we create the reality through our observations. In fact, that's the thesis of this new movie called What the Bleed Can We Know? That's just only one theory and a very indefensible theory about indeterminacy in quantum physics. It has to do with the collapse of the wave function and so on. And it's a non-realist view. It's in the minority view. And... There's no good reason to interpret it that way. But if we are limited in what we can know about some atomic particles, given our position, that does not undermine the possibility of knowing things empirically, nor does it mean that the correspondence view of truth is false. It just means there are limits to human knowing. Sure. And maybe we've discovered some limits that were surprising to us. But I'm not an expert on this, but... You oftentimes hear quantum physics referred to as refuting the law of non-contradiction, as refuting realism, and as making the world kind of an arbitrary construct of different human minds. It's not true. There are no good arguments for any of those propositions. Oftentimes, invoking quantum physics is kind of a, a placeholder remark. It's like, well, somehow the quantum physics has, has undermined all these things. But they never actually tell you how it is. Or if they do the arguments end up being very, very bad and they often presuppose the things they're supposed to undermine. Okay. I dealt with quantum physics very briefly in one, one of my books, which amazingly enough is not required for this class, called Unmasking the New Age. I've got a, a chapter on New Age physics where I deal with that just briefly and it's not in depth because I'm not a physicist by any means. But I looked at that 
as an argument for supporting the New Age worldview. And I found it to be extremely questionable. Yes, Ralph. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, there's an issue here with respect to whether there truly are random events in the universe or not, or whether they merely appear random. It has to do with whether or not there are deep variables. And Einstein thought there were deep, as yet unknown variables. His famous remark was, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Okay. And in fact, uh, what you're saying, superstring theory, Jeremy, gives a possible explanation for quantum phenomena that does not, uh, does not require a causal event. Let, let's, let's cut to the chase apologetically. Whenever anybody invokes quantum physics to undermine the laws of logic, realism, or uh, the correspondence view of truth, or anything like that, just ask them to give the argument. Okay. All right, now what about workability and epistemology? First of all, we have to dispense with pragmatism as a theory of truth. But we want to use a pragmatic criteria as an element of knowledge. Very important distinction here. Pragmatism as a theory of truth, as articulated by William James, Dewey, and others, Peirce, and they all had slightly different views, but let's maybe camp out more on William James here. It's the idea that the truth is what produces beneficial states of affairs. So a proposition is only as good as its cash value. So truth actually has to do with benefit. Something is true if it provides benefits. The shorthand is it's true if it works. And oftentimes people subjectivize and say it's true if it works for me. It may not be true for you because it may not work for you. Now as a theory of truth, this is about as bad as it gets. Because there are a lot of times when we believe things that produce states of affairs, but we later find out the beliefs are false. And Corduan gives an example of someone who thinks that they have had money robbed from them. And so they, excuse me, they they think they lost the money. And so they work very hard to clean up their lives and not be so disorganized. And they, they credit the time when they lost this money to reforming their life for the better. It ends up, they find out later, the money was stolen. Now, the belief had a positive effect, but the belief was false. Some beliefs have positive effects and are false. Some beliefs have, beliefs have positive effects and are true. Some beliefs, you have no idea what the effects are. And it's totally irrelevant. But, pragmatism as a test, one of several tests for truth, has an important function. Actually, there's another, another reductio argument against pragmatism, and it has to do with comparative religion. People might say that religions work for various people. So Buddhism may work for Buddhists, Christians work, Christianity works for Christians, and so on. In fact, I gave a lecture in Boulder some years ago. It was about Jesus and Buddha. All religions can't be one because Jesus and Buddha made contradictory claims. And I argued my soul out for an hour and tried to make all these category distinctions and clarifications and conclusions and citing evidence and so on. And this woman came up afterwards and said, I don't understand this one point in your outline. If Buddhism is, Buddhism and Christianity cannot both be true. What if you have a Buddhist monk who meditates and is very happy with the meditation and the meditation makes the Buddhist monk feel great and you have a Christian who loves to pray and read the Bible and makes them feel great and they're really happy with it? You see, they're both true. I said, all right, let's think about this. It just, this example just came to me in a flash. I said, what if, what if we have a married couple and one of the members of the couple, one spouse is cheating on the other one, but the other one doesn't know it. But the other one is completely oblivious and thinks it's a wonderful relationship and everything is working just fine. Now, does that mean that it is really a wonderful relationship because they believe it is and they feel great about it? And I think she got the point because afterwards she shifted and, and she said, well, how can you know what's true? 
I thought that was a victory, frankly, because she switched from a kind of pragmatism to skepticism, which is better. Because skepticism says, well, there's a truth out there, but I'm not sure how to get to it. See, the pragmatism is really just another form of postmodernism, really. Which says, if it works for you, if it's your construct and so on, it's fine. They don't contradict each other. You know, my enjoyment of, of one flavor of ice cream doesn't contradict your enjoyment of another flavor as your favorite flavor. And I gave this example. I, apparently, a light just got turned on and she switched from non-realism or this pragmatic view to skepticism. So then we talked about how you could investigate Christian truth claims. Now, I think that was a huge step forward. And you have to do that in apologetics. You don't just try to get somebody to accept Jesus. Now, I'm not a heretic by saying that. You don't just get somebody to try to, to accept Jesus. Because sometimes if you're in people's face enough, they'll do it and they don't mean it just to get you off their back. Or they will do it when they think they understand what it means and they have no idea what it means. It means, well, this may be a spiritually satisfying way for me to live. I'll try it for a while. You know, Jesus come into my life, etc., etc., etc. And they don't really mean what you mean or what the Bible means. Now, how does workability relate to knowledge? Well, in some cases, if a claim, if a proposition is true, it will be verified by how well it works. Not always, but it may be. So you have to very carefully look at the truth claim and see what the conditions of verification might be. All right? Now, now with larger worldview questions, if a worldview is trying to attempt to explain the human condition and how that fits into the universe and how human beings can flourish in the universe, now not all worldviews attempt to do that, but many do. That if it, say, if it says, this is the way things are, this is the way humans are, and if you know that, it should contribute to your benefit and flourishing. And it radically does not. That is, if you're given a worldview where you have to bump up against things that should not exist all the time, then there's something wrong with your worldview. Now, you notice I put it in a negative way. Just because your worldview seems to be working doesn't mean it's true. You could be deceived. You could be deluded. But if it's radically not working because experience and empirical evidence is refuting it all the time, then something's wrong. For instance, anyone who holds that objective evil does not exist. New Agers believe that. All right? They believe that evil is just a lower level of consciousness. Or there would be no evil if people didn't think there were evil. Or evil, this is the real heavy one, evil is just live spelled backwards. What that is supposed to prove, I have no idea. Now, if someone believes that, then they have to deal with their conscience when they know that they have done things that are wrong. But they can't do things wrong because there's no wrong. It's all relativized to consciousness. And they can't condemn anyone else as being evil or being immoral or being cruel or being racist or sexist or anything else because the category of evil is a mere illusion for the unenlightened mind. Christian science believe this. The mind sciences teach this. It's part and parcel of what uh, we sometimes call the New Age spirituality. Now, that worldview, day by day, is going to be difficult to live out consistently, especially on September 11th, 2001. Now, it can be done if people are completely oblivious and stupefied to reality. It can be done. I mean, take Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra, please. Deepak Chopra is a non-dualist. He doesn't believe there is such a thing as evil. He was taught by Maharishi. He's a very popular writer. You may have seen him on PBS, those of you who still watch television. And Chopra believes that all is one, all is divine, and that we are all divine, and there's no good and evil. And so, in one of his books, The Seven Laws of Spiritual Success, he has something called a non-judgment meditation. Where, you see, you, you kind of interrupt the energy flow by making judgments. And if you want the energy flow, Brahman, really, if you want Brahman to flow through you perfectly, then you stop making judgment. So you do the non-judgment meditation. So every day for a particular amount of time, you don't judge anything. You just accept everything. And I thought, 
what if it happened to be Columbine Day and you just found out about it? Well, you just accept everything. What if it's 9-11? What if it's Russian school children being blown up and shot in the back and starved to death and so on? Frightened to death. Well, you just, you just don't judge. You just accept. Wasn't there something wrong with the worldview that would tell you to do that? There are other kinds of examples too. But workability is a, is a negative test on a worldview. Now, you have to deal with it carefully, honestly, because there are some times when it seems like Christianity isn't working. Now, part of the problem with that is this. We have been sold a bill of goods as to what Christianity is. And what we typically leave out is the suffering part. And we leave out the lamentation, which is right there in the Bible. There's even a whole book called Lamentations. Or read Habakkuk. He's crying out, God, how can you allow this to occur? It's horrible. Not, not allow it. How do you, why do you bring this about? See, back it was Calvinist. So why do you bring this about? And I don't understand it. And the Psalms are lamenting the evil in the world. Basically saying, God, what happened? I don't see you. I don't feel you. I don't understand. That is a part of the life of faith. But oftentimes we're not told that when we sign up. And I've been told it 10, 20 years later. I hope Nancy Bushart does it. She's got an idea for a book called The Day God Died. And it has to do with uh, Pro- Professor Bushart's wife. She's very gifted in, in mentoring and writing and, and the arts and so on. And I've looked at her proposal. I hope she gets it published. She faced a series of tragedies in her life over a several year period. And she had, was never given the categories to deal with it within the Christian faith, within the church. And it came down to knowing how to lament, knowing how to suffer in a way that comports with Scripture without being just joshed out of it or hearing Pollyanna remarks and so on. So you've got to be careful here because what does it mean for something to work? Well, for Christianity, part of working is being blessed when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. That's part of what it means for it to work. Right? So the Gospel, the entire Bible redefines what it means for something to be successful. We've got to figure that out. I mean, if someone says, look, when I came to Christ, my life got worse. You say, congratulations. Now, your standing with God got a whole lot better. In fact, it's now fine in terms of justification. Your standing with your ongoing sinful nature and the world and worldliness is now going to be extremely difficult to negotiate and get used to it because it'll go on until you're glorified. You with me on this? Can anybody say Amen. All right. Questions or comments on these on these criteria for knowledge? I know I'm covering a lot of ground quickly, but again, you've got to get your epistemology figured out, at least a rough and ready epistemology. How do I know a proposition is true? What elements do I appeal to? Self-knowledge, empirical knowledge, rational deduction, and in a limited sense, workability. You've got to be really careful with that workability one, though for reasons I've discussed. Yes, Tim? Right. Well, you're just saying that if you know X, it's justified true belief. The question is whether or not you know it. That's the project of epistemology. Now, in some cases, it's very easy. The law of non-contradiction is a necessary truth. I know that. And I know that I know that. I I have no doubt whatsoever about that. In other cases, there may be somewhat more room for doubt. But I may make... In fact, I may say I believe this, but I don't know it. I think it's true, but I can't say that I know it's true. That's legitimate. There are certain spheres of knowledge where you should not make knowledge claims. So, you know, being a wise person epistemically is knowing when to affirm, when to deny, and when to remain neutral. It's not that your goal is to be able to have absolute certainty about everything that you ever say. Human beings are not in that condition. God is, but humans aren't. So, the better part of wisdom here is, and the great 
quote from Pascal on this that I haven't really memorized, but I've kind of given you the gist of it. When do you affirm? When do you deny? And, uh, and when do you just remain open to other possibilities? It's kind of jamming on a theme of Pascal there. Um, but simply to say, I know X, does not justify it. 